Hey guys, what's up? Kelvin here. Today we're going to be looking at a feature called BFD, bidirectional forward detection. Now, if your first thoughts after hearing the acronym BFD were big freaking deal, clearly you've got more awareness of English acronyms than I do because I actually never knew that BFD stood for a big freaking deal or if you choose the more vulgar version of that until someone very recently told me. So yeah, you're going to have to let me know in the console oh, where you find the meanings to your acronyms and maybe I'll know some more acronyms. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, BFD stands for bidirectional forward detection. And it's a really useful feature that lets you detect forwarding failures at sub-second intervals. So this feature was actually released relatively recently. It's within the last decade or so. Uh, the RFC for it is dated uh, June of 2010. So again, give or take a few months within the last decade or so. So more about BFD after my intro. See you guys then. So let's go ahead and look at this topology here, as I said we would. So as you can see here, we have four routers um, and two switches here. And router four is advertising a loopback of 444-32 into OSPF, which is our routing protocol of choice here. So it is important to note that BFD as a feature is protocol independent, which means that we could be running EIGRP, BGP, ISIS, even RIP, right? So we could be running those protocols here and still have this work. And we have redundancy in the sense that we have two of what are essentially the same paths uh, from R1 to R2 to R4 and then from R1 to R3 to R4, right? So this is a good topology that we'll be working with. And I have hypothetically in this scenario, let's say that I manipulated the costs of this path here so that it would be artificially higher than the cost of going through here. So R1 does not load balance with traffic. It instead uh, just straight up uses R the path through R2 for 100% of the traffic. Let's say that Jimmy, right? So from our Ether channel video, if you've seen that, uh, Jimmy comes along with the scissors and he wants to have some fun with the cables again. And he ends up cutting this cable in half, right? Now, what will happen? Firstly, the interfaces on both R2 and R4 end up going down because you've now just lost layer one reachability. Uh, those interfaces are going to go down. And along with those interfaces, the OSPF adjacency um, behind that interface will also go down. So basically, the adjacency from R2 to R4 goes down. R2 loses a copy of 4444 slash 32 from its LSDB. And um, long story short, without going into the specifics of how OSPF does this, R1 will transition the next hop from R2 to R3 if that link goes down. And then that way, you're not black holing traffic. Uh, any traffic coming into R1 that wants to go to 4444-32 will take the new path and all is dandy, right? This broken path hasn't really impacted any um, substantial amount of reachability. Right, so that's if that link fails. Here's what we're going to do next. So let's say that we repaired this cable and Jimmy's not really all that happy about having his um, damage repaired. So let's say that Jimmy comes along with uh, another pair of scissors and he cuts this cable between the switch and R2. Now we have a big problem here. Here's what happens. It's the same concept here. This interface goes down and this interface goes down, and R2, being smart, says, oh, well, the interface went down, so if I don't bring it down, if I don't bring the LSPF adjacency down now, then it will go down in about 40 seconds, so, or whatever the whole time is. So let's go ahead and just bring out the adjacency uh, preemptively since the interface went down, that, we, th that way we can go ahead and have a little faster convergence, right? All fine and dandy, except for the fact that because this isn't a layer uh, one or two failure from R1's perspective, this interface is still up and going. And so R2 will have brought down its side of the adjacency, but R1 knows nothing about what happened over here. The only thing it knows is, hey, well, I'm looking at my interface, it's still up, but, um, huh, um, interesting. This, um, 
this uh, this router here, this router two over here, isn't sending me any more um, OSPF hello packets, and it's gonna wait. And by default, on a broadcast uh, multi-access segment, it's going to wait forty seconds, which is the default hold timer. And it's going to wait until that hold timer ticks down to zero, and then it's going to say, "Ah, well, crap. Um, that guy hasn't sent me any hellos. I will just go ahead and bring down the, this adjacency now because my hold time has expired, and it's going to um, just." Go ahead and transition from using R2 as the next top to R3 as the next top, right? So what's the problem with that? While I was ticking down on my watch, R2 is unreachable. If R1 tries to send traffic to R2, it can't because this link right here has failed because that's how physics works. <laughs> Electrons can't just magically teleport from one router to the other. That means that while I was ticking down and while OSPF was ticking down until, uh, or, or its hold timer rather, um, you're black holing traffic. Because if any traffic comes in on R1 that needs to go to 4444, it's going to get sent out this next top interface. It's going to get sent to um, this switch with the destination of the router. And um, essentially, you're going to black hole traffic because that's unreachable. So you're trying to send traffic down a path that's broken and when you already have a perfectly functioning path right here. So that is where the problem comes in. A lot of times you might have a more subtle failure that's not necessarily going to be picked up by an interface drop. So BFD comes in here to say good day. So with a routing protocol that has hello messages and hello timers and hold timers like OSPF. OSPF has a default hello timer on Ethernet networks of 10 seconds and a default hold timer of 40 seconds. And it has these hello messages that are multicasted onto the link. So essentially what it does is it will send hello messages every 10 seconds and then if it hasn't received hello messages from a particular neighbor for 40 seconds, it will go ahead and kill the adjacency because the neighbor is assumed down. BFD does something very similar. It has BFD messages that go between the two routers as keep alives in a sense. Now you might be wondering, oh, well, uh, why are you uh, using BFD in that case? Because it's doing the exact thing as OSPF, but much, much faster. So the minimum uh, transmit time that you can have, the minimum interval between keep alive messages that you can have in BFD is, it isn't five seconds, it's not four seconds, not three seconds, not two seconds, not even one second, it's 50 milliseconds. So you can have BFD keep alives going out from router one to router two at 50 milliseconds per keep alive. And the minimum multiplier that you can have in order to detect that the link has failed is three. So within 150 milliseconds of this link right here failing, you already know that R2 is unreachable and that you need to drop the adjacency. So instead of black hole and traffic for 40 seconds by default, like you might have with OSPF's default timers, and I'll say default because I'll get to changing the timers in a second, instead of dropping traffic for 40 seconds, now you're dropping traffic for 150 milliseconds, which is a much, much improved time, as you can probably tell. Uh, BFD will establish a session, a neighborship, and it's going to use that to keep track of whether each are reachable. If it detects that the uh, session is down, it's going to bring that uh, entire session down, and then it's going to report to OSPF saying, hey, look, uh, I know that uh, you were configured to check with me whether these two routers were still reachable, and uh, they're not anymore. So OSPF will kind of preempt the whole, uh, whole timer thing, and then it will bring the adjacency down preemptively, and then it's going to therefore transition the uh, routing table entry for 4444 slash 32 in this case from going through R2 to going through R3. So in essence, if you didn't catch anything of what I was talking about there, um, first of all, you can go back in the video. But secondly, the main thing I want, I want you to get out of that is that BFD in our application here can be used to detect subtle failures between R1 and R2. And when those subtle failures happen, we don't have to wait 40 seconds or the default OSPF timer for uh, multi-access segments to bring that down. We can go ahead and use BFD to quickly and within a second detect that that link is down or that that reachability is down, uh, trigger BFD to bring the session down, and then trigger OSPF through the use of BFD to bring the entire OSPF adjacency down. And then that way we can have R1 transition to using R3 as its next hop much, much faster than we ordinarily could. Now, I know what you might be saying in response to this. Well, hey, um, OSPF has sub-second detection. 
it has um, what we call a multiplier. So essentially what you do is you configure your hold timer, right? And then you configure it with um, a minimum interval. So let's say um, a minimum interval of five, right? And what that essentially does is it sets the hello interval to be 200 milliseconds, and then the hold time to be one second. Now the problem with that, in OSPF's case specifically, is that that hold timer can never go below one second, because essentially what you're doing is you are setting them, you're saying the hold time to be the minimum, which is one second, and then you're essentially saying, okay, well, um, I want to miss five hellos before I bring the adjacency down. And then OSPF has got to do the math, oh, okay, well, uh, one second divided in five is going to be 200 milliseconds. With that being said, BFD can work much, much faster. Instead of 200 milliseconds hello and one second hold, we can have 50 millisecond hello and 150 millisecond holds. And that's going to help us to bring down the adjacency much faster and reconverge, again, much faster. And the advantage of BFD is that it does this in the data plane. So BFD is scalable, whereas with OSPF, those timers and those hello messages are all being generated by the CPU in the control plane, and they're being sent out. So it's as you reduce your whole timer, not substantially on modern platforms, but you would be tasking your CPU with more in the sense that you have to generate those hello packets and send them out and then task your CPU and your control plane with managing all of that. So let's go ahead and wrap it up for today's video. In this video, we talked about what BFD is, why you want to use it, and uh, how we could apply it to example topologies such as this one. In the next video, I'm actually going to go ahead and take this example topology, configure it in CML, and then we'll go ahead and firstly, we're going to simulate a link failure and see how OSPF's default timers do it. And then we'll look at how we can configure OSPF in particular to have these minimum hold timer and hello timer so we can have sub-second hello intervals. And then we're going to configure BFD and see what kind of effect that has on our convergence times. And so if you want to go ahead and see the next video, make sure you subscribe and turn on the notifications so you don't miss when that video drops. It should be dropping very soon. Uh, if you like this video, go ahead and leave a like. If you have a comment, uh, feed, any feedback, suggestions, anything like that, I just want to hear from you guys. Go ahead and drop a comment down below. I really love hearing from you guys, and you guys have given me some great feedback as to how to improve already. And yeah, I hope this helps you. And until next time, more Cisco. See you then.